John. Let's go to John's Gospel. Oh, Jesus. Guys, everyone out there that wants to receive Jesus today and receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I'm telling you right now, today's your day. You're going to under you're going to see this and you're going to understand the word of God and you're going to believe that his word is true and you're going to receive it. I'm telling you right now, guys, y'all bear with me. John 20, verse 19, that then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, they were afraid because they were looking for everybody to kill them. They, uh, they done said the disciples stole the body of Jesus, all right? They were mis the misinformation agenda, a psyops was in effect at the time. The, the, the Jewish snake serpent pharmaceutical okay this is um i mean i'm not going to get into that right now but i can tell you right now the noah hide people if you want to call it the same people were doing the same thing they're doing now they were misinformation psyops and the whole population telling them that jesus's body was stolen by disciples okay when in reality an angel showed up and rolled the stone away and those Roman big burly men, the Roman soldiers, all fell down like they were dead in the presence of that angel. And Jesus walked out of that tomb. Verse 19, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, came Jesus. So Jesus came and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side, and they, the disciples, were glad and they, when they saw the Lord. Verse 21, then Jesus said to them, what did Jesus say? Now, this is John's perspective. Now, think of a building. You have Matthew's perspective of a, of a building. You have Mark's perspective. And you got Luke's perspective and John's perspective. And they're all telling the same gospel, but giving it in different perspective. Why? Because they were each of these people were writing letters and writing letters to the different people. Matthew was writing letters to some Jews. Therefore, he made a big emphasis on the kingdom of heaven, about the Jewish festivals. He made a big emphasis on what those Jews needed to hear of the gospel. Now, Luke was writing it to a guy who was a rich man, and he was writing a very thorough um, writing or doctorate to a rich man, Luke and Acts. Mark was writing it, showing the power of God because the person he was needed, you know, anyways, we'll go into that later. Okay, then said Jesus to them, verse 21, peace be unto you. Listen to this. Here is the commission. He says, as my father hath sent me, even so send I you. Verse 22, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Look what he said. He appears to them, and he gives them the commission. As the Father hath sent me, even so send I you. So John puts it in a summary. He said, instead of saying, Go into all the world, preach the gospel of every creature. Whoever is baptized, whoever is believes and is baptized the same, who doesn't is damned. He says, these signs shall follow them. He didn't go into all that. He didn't say, go into all the world and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always. He didn't go into what Mark's, he, Mark went into certain detail. Matthew went into certain detail. Luke went into a little detail. He said, go and wait, and I'm going to endow you with power. Look what John says. John says, very simple, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. When did the disciples get born again? See, people don't want to believe verse 23, whosoever sends you are met. See, you can lead people to Jesus. When you lead them to Jesus and tell them their sins are forgiven, their sins are forgiven. You can lead them into praying. You can, listen, First John, he says it again. When you lead someone to Jesus and tell them their sins are forgiven, their sins are forgiven. Jesus did it. He says, hey, man, your sins are forgiven. And they, they were like, what? Who is this man? That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sin. Well, he was only saying what God had told him to say. God, Jesus, God the Father taught Jesus that he was to go and forgive people their sins. What did he do? He went and did it. He told someone else, go and sin no more. 
Here's what I'm saying. When did the disciples get born again? Okay, I'm going to answer. John 20, verse 22. This is when Jesus, this is when the disciples were born again. Remember Genesis. It says, and, it says, and God breathed into Adam the breath of life, the Ruach, and man became a living soul. Ruach is the same, you know, in the Greek, the Greek word for Holy Ghost means breath. All scripture is inspired by God or is God breathed. The Ruach, the breath of God, Jesus, who was resurrected from the dead and about to go into heaven. He breathed into the disciples the breath of life. This is when the disciples got born again. They were born again now. They received the spirit so that Jesus, he said, I'm not going to leave you orphans. He breathed in. He, he went into heaven and left his disciples born again. This is when the disciples were born again. They received the Holy Ghost. When are you born again? When you receive the Holy Ghost. No man comes to the Father except the Spirit draw him. They were born again now. And then when they went after here and went into Jerusalem. Let's keep reading. Look at the, go to the book of Acts with me, guys. Go to Acts chapter 1. Okay, Acts chapter 1. We've already went through Matthew, Mark, Luke. Now we went through John, and now we're looking at Acts. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, guys. Now, this is Luke again. Look what he says. Verse 1, the former treaties, that's the book of Luke, the former writing, have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began. You should say that out loud. Say, began to do and teach. The book of Luke when he wrote the, his first letter to this man, Theophilus, with everything Jesus would, he began both to do and teach the gospel. Okay? Verse 2, until the day that what he began to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up when Jesus ascended into heaven. He's giving them a quick summary here in this first chapter. Okay? So the first chapter of Acts is Luke giving a summary of, of the first letter that he wrote to this guy, what we call the book of Luke. All right. Now, he said, everything Jesus began both to do and teach, verse 2, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, Jesus, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. So after he appeared to them, I was reading you everything he was saying to them, after he arisen it says here that he was speaking after he rose from the dead a resurrected being jesus rose from the dead he was speaking to them by the holy ghost it says right here through the holy ghost he was given commandments unto the apostles every one of those great commissions are the commandments that jesus was commanding his disciples through the holy ghost after he was arisen and now Luke goes into a summary just to make sure this guy remembers what those commandments were. Verse 3, to whom, those he had, his apostles, also he showed himself alive after his suffering, his passion, by many infallible proofs, okay, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now, I read that to you earlier. He was speaking about the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, everything that was written to him. He was with them alive for 40 days. He went out on the lake, and he ate fish with the disciples on the lake when Peter went fishing. He was in Drew. He, he appeared to them everywhere. He walked on the road, on the road in Emmaus, the roads in Emmaus. He was walking in a road with two of the disciples, and they said a fire burned within them as they spoke, and they didn't realize it was Jesus until after he you know, left. Forty days, he's there teaching them things about the kingdom of God. He was clearly opening their understanding about all the parables he spoke to them, 
He was clearly telling them now why, because he breathed the life they were born again. Because you can't understand this fully unless the Holy Spirit is in you and he is in you to reveal what this word says. Because to a carnal man, this is foolishness. But to those who are born again and have the Spirit of God, it makes sense because now you're in the Spirit and you can understand. So 40 days, he's showing himself with infallible proofs, speaking to them the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Okay, so he's giving them a summary here. 40 days, he was risen from the dead, speaking to them about the kingdom. Now we're going to get into some good stuff, the Lord Jesus. Verse 4, and being assembled together with him after he was risen, he was assembled, remember, showing them his hands and feet and his side. He commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. Remember Luke 24, 49? He told them not to, he said, wait in Jerusalem until you're clothed with power from on high. Now he's re-emphasizing this to the same man, Theophilus. He is bringing the point home really well. It says, remember, he was assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. Remember, there he goes again, talking about the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So he's saying, look, remember, remember the John baptism that I... They baptize people too. Jesus, his disciples baptize people. He says, remember, there's baptism in water. John baptized with water. But you're about to get into a whole nother baptism. You're going to be immersed with the Holy Ghost not many days after this. Verse 6, when they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, when will you restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times and seasons which my father hath put in his own power. Verse 8, but ye shall receive power. There he goes again. Dunamis, dynamite power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Remember, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. All right? He said, these signs shall follow you when you go. Now he's telling them again, you'll receive power when the Holy Ghost comes on you and you will go be a witness as you proclaim and teach into all the world. He's emphasizing the same commission. Now, I want to know, is there any question in your mind now that every single Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, every one of our gospels tells us the same mission before he went into heaven, the same mission to go. There should be nothing in you unsettled about that. He says to go. What does go mean, though? That means everywhere you go. It's when, you, when you wake up from your bed, it means to your family. When you get in your car and if, when you're at the gas station, when you're at work, when you're at church, everywhere you go, you are to love God and love others. As he's loved you, go love him. Take the example of Jesus and do it. Go be a witness Go give love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and faithfulness to everyone you go around. But it also means to actually go and preach, proclaim the good news that Jesus Christ is alive, that there is forgiveness of sins. He means go and heal the sick and cast out devils and raise the dead. Freely you've received, freely give. He's saying go to every creature, every one of you. It means it applies to you because the disciples were told, Whatever I've commanded you, disciples, you teach the same commandments to those that you go and reach. And that means you're going to teach the next people to do whatever you've commanded that Jesus has spoken. And perpetually, forever, in all generations, we are to preach what Jesus commanded his disciples. And we, and whatever the gospel is that Paul and all of his disciples have made known, the understanding Remember, the understanding that happened after the cross, we don't have written down. He didn't go through everything for 40 days that he had written down. He didn't go through it all. We don't have that written down. That's why we needed Peter, James, and the Apostle Paul to write the mysteries that have been revealed after the cross. They've written it down in the New Testament. That's why Jesus told his disciples in 
John 14 through 16, we'll go through this. He says, these things, there's some things, disciples, he's talking to his disciples, there's some things you can't bear now. I can't tell you everything. But when the Holy Spirit comes, he will show you all things. He will teach you all things. He will go and remind you everything that I've spoken to you. Okay? Now, that's why we have the New Testament after the cross. That's why the Apostle Paul was taken into heaven and by Jesus spoke and revealed to him the gospel after the cross for the Gentiles. That's why we have the New Testament because he couldn't say everything before the cross because it was not yet finished. After he rose from the dead and he showed himself alive to his disciples, he made it very clear and opened up the scripture. He opened up how everything was fulfilled, the Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, everything was fulfilled and it was finished in him. He showed him the kingdom. He revealed it all to them and said, now I've taught you all this. Now you go and teach everything I just told you. He couldn't do it before because he had to fulfill the, the law. He had to go by the law because he fulfilled the law. When he died on the cross, he canceled the law and said when he rose from the dead, he canceled everything. Now, Gentiles and Jews are one new man, one creation. All of us, there's not Jew nor Greek. There's not male nor female. There's not white, black, purple, orange, or nothing. In Christ, there is now what God calls equality. You don't have to listen to the UN agenda. You don't have to listen to all that about equality, equality, and just all that. Christ already gave in quality. It's in him. Everyone is one now in him. If you want equality, you got it. Females, you want, you know, equal rights, you got it. If you, listen, all this world's solution is found after the cross in Jesus. It's here. It has been finished. You got equality, guys. You ain't got to stop looking for it in a, in a copy, in an illegal form of it that Satan gives everybody right now called a one world government. That is false and that will always fail. The only way you get equality is to die to yourself and all of your image, everything about you and give it to Jesus. Let's keep going. Now, we're going to go, guys. Look here. Acts chapter 1, verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taking up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Here we go again. We just read it for the fifth time. As if you needed any more proof. <laughs> this is for you guys. This is for you to get out of false doctrine, to get out of error. This is for you to have it settled once and for all. Why am I going line upon line? Because this is rampant in our church and it needs to be taught once and for all, broken down with absolute conviction and settled that it is the word of God and it's true. So you don't get tossed to and fro anymore. This is it. Verse 10. And while they, they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Here comes two angels. What did the angels say? Which also said, ye men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. He's saying, guys, don't be standing here gazing. Get busy. He told you to go. Go wait in Jerusalem. Why are you standing here looking into heaven? He's going to come back, but you have to go and do your job. He's coming back right here the same way. Stop standing around. Get busy because he's coming back. And what do they do? Let's keep reading. Acts chapter 2. They were up in an upper room. There was 120 people in an upper room that waited. There was 500 that looked at Jesus going to heaven. But only 120 of them continued waiting for 10 days. They thought he was going to come right then, but people got tired of waiting, and they left. Only 120 were left. Out of 500 who watched him appear and go into heaven, 120 were left in the upper room. Okay? Acts chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Why is that important? Because Pentecost means 50. Okay, Jesus was, you know, very crucified and everything on, back then, on a feast day. Everybody here pretty much understands this. It was that. Get some water. Jesus was buried or crucified on Passover. Okay? And in 40 days, he was showing himself alive, and he went into heaven 40 days. Ten days later, the day of Pentecost was fully come. 
So one festival goes into the next festival. You see? He goes in, and we're not going to get in that. It's too much time. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, now, I just let you know, it was 50 days after he was dead. He on the cross, 50 days later, okay, so he was with them 40 days, and then there was 10 days they were in the upper room waiting for the, the promise of the Father to clothe them with power so they can go into all the world and be witnesses and preach and teach and make disciples, okay? Here they were, now 10 days later waiting. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, I'm not going to teach you about all the different prophetic things that happened here, but what I want you to know is they got clothed with power. They received dunamis, dynamite power to go do what Jesus did. He says, he that believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also because I go unto my father. What did he do when he went into his father? He sent his Holy Spirit here and they were clothed with power. He says, on that great day of the feast, John 7, 37, he says, he that believes on me, as the scripture says, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Right? The next verse says, but this spake he of the Spirit, which was not yet given. Okay? He was talking about the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit came down, when he was given, they were clothed with power. And out of him now flows, and out of the disciples now flow power rivers of living water now life comes out now when they lay their hands life flows out of them into someone else when they speak power comes out of their mouth life comes out of their mouth they can preach the gospel with what people call now the anointing but really it's the life and the power of god in somebody and when they speak it flows like jesus said he says that it's, the flesh does nothing it is the spirit that gives life okay that's what he said. The words that I speak, they are spirit in their life. Now, this is when they got filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul, Peter, I mean, Peter, who denied Jesus three times, now gets up and with boldness preaches the gospel. 3,000 people got saved. Okay? Look at verse 17. He gets up and preaches and says, he says, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit. Notice that he didn't say pour out my spirit. Oh, the doctrine out there is that God pours out his spirit from heaven. Now, Jesus, the Holy Spirit did come from heaven right then. But notice what he says, I will pour out. He didn't say I'll pour out my spirit like he's pouring out a glass of water. He says he will pour out, look what it says, out of my spirit upon all flesh. His Holy Spirit came down and then out of his spirit, he pours out, out of us. He pours out of his spirit upon all flesh. Now, everywhere you go, when you preach and you're being a witness, the Holy Spirit pours out of his spirit. He pours out of the spirit. He didn't say he pours out of heaven. He pours out of his spirit upon all flesh. And then look what he says. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. That means boys and girls, men and women, now are full of the spirit. Now, every one of us, sons and daughters, our one creation and because we're in Christ we're all clothed with power and we all can prophesy we can edify we can encourage and we can comfort we can all work in the gifts of the spirit the manifestation we can all we're all now believers and because we're believers these signs will follow you because you're a believer and that's the only qualification is being a believer if you believe then you can do it your, men, your sons and daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your young and your old men shall dream dreams and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy and I will show wonders in heaven and other signs and look what it says verse 21 and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved now that word saved means to be rescued rescued from what you might ask that's what it's all about rescued from yourself your sinful nature sin 
from darkness, from sickness and disease and from death. You are rescued from whatever it is. That's part of what the enemy does to steal, kill, and destroy. He comes to rescue from the enemy. He rescues you from the kingdom of darkness, from the law of sin and death. Okay, let's keep going. All right. Look at this. Verse 21. I'm going to show you the Greek word. Verse 21. Look, this is, shows you all the Greek words. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Greek word is one. All right. And uh, if you go look in there, it's 1941. The Greek word is apikaliomahi. <laughs> apikaliomahi. Anyways, it means to entitle, to invoke, make a decision, right? To appeal, to call on a certain a surname. So it means like when you're getting served by a server to call upon the name of the Lord. Now, a server calls upon you. They, they wait upon you. To wait upon the Lord doesn't mean to sit here and wait and do nothing. It means to be a waiter, to serve. It means when the king says, hey, you come looking. You, you have your eyes on the king at all times. And when he, he you predict what he needs, oh, he, oh, and you go do it for him. Whatever he needs, you go do. You're calling upon his name. You're a waiter. You're a server. So whosoever shall make a decision, okay, to appeal to Jesus, to forgive you, to make a decision, to turn away from your ways, and to come to him to make a decision and to wait upon Jesus, to serve, to come at him, okay, to take upon Jesus. That means to join his movement, to take on his surname. That means to change your name. That means to change everything about you, no longer living for yourself. If you call upon Jesus, that means you decide to trust your life on Jesus, and you come at him, and you now take on his name, and you're enlisted in his army. Okay, let's keep going. Verse 33, G Peter gets up and preaches and says about Jesus, Therefore, Jesus, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father, listen to this, whoo, baby, Jesus got exalted. Look what he did. Having received of the Father, Jesus received of the Father, the promise of the Holy Ghost. Look at that. What's the promise of the Father, everybody? It's the Holy Ghost. The promise of the Holy Ghost. He hath shed forth this, which you now see and hear. Luis, right now. Luis. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. Luis, look at me right now. Take your hands, put it on your head. Right now. Luis, this might be a this might be more than a headache. I feel like the word of God, the life and the power of God is going into you. And there is something manifested. Your headache is about to go. So look at me right now. Put your hand on your head. Okay? Repeat after me right now. Say, Father. In the name of Jesus, forgive me. I repent. I give you my life. Save me now. All of my life belongs to you. Repeat after me. Now put your hand on your head. And to repeat after me, say, in the name of Jesus, I command this headache to go now in Jesus' name. So right now, in Jesus' name, headache, you listen to me. You spirit right now, in the name of Jesus, I'm speaking to you, and I command you to go from her now in the name of Jesus. Come out right now. Freedom in the name of Jesus. Come out. Go now in Jesus' name. Go now, right now. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Okay. And you can, you can repeat on there how you feel. All right. Felt like the enemy was doing something with you. Let's keep going. Now, look what Peter says. He gets up and preaches and says, The promise of the Father has just been shed forth at the day of Pentecost. Where, what all these people standing around were seeing and hearing was the Holy Ghost. Okay? That was the promise of the Father. Let's keep going. Now, when they all heard this, when they heard the preaching of Peter, they were pricked. 
They were poked. They were convicted, like a doctor going in and poking to find out where your pain is. They were definitely, they were pricked and poked like, oh my goodness, they were pricked in their heart. They felt convicted and said unto Peter to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? So here we go. I've laid the foundation. 